Thank you very much. Uh, just a brief overview of what we're going to be doing today. I have three presentations. The first one will run until about 10 o'clock, and then we're going to take about a half hour break. We'll start back with the second session at 10.30. Uh, when we end that, at around 11.30, we'll take a lunch break. After lunch, we'll have the third session, and then we're going to close with the Eucharist, this being the Feast of St. Bartholomew, one of the 12 apostles of uh, the One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. What are we going to be talking about this morning in this first session is uh, the actual history of the church. We talk about Catholicity. And let me begin by explaining what that word Catholic means. It has a whole lot of different meanings, but actually in the Greek, Catholicos, according to the whole. Catholic means universal, that which is everything. It also has a meaning, a secondary meaning to some people, that's a Roman Catholic. And, and the interesting thing is the so-called Catholic Church official name is the Holy Roman Church. The word Catholic isn't even in the official title. Um, but that word Catholic is, is, in the minds of some, a consonant with the Church of Rome. The word Catholic also is a secular term. The word Catholic, as I said, means universal. And if you like every kind of food there is, you are said to have a Catholic taste in food. Um, the opposite of Catholic is not Protestant. <laughs> the word Protestant actually originally meant someone who spoke in favor of someone. Protesto, I speak for. And originally a Protestant was someone who spoke for something. Um, Having been a lawyer and a judge for many years, I can tell you also that that term is used in legal terms. If you make an application in Oklahoma, for example, for the Corporation Commission for a permit to run a truck line, uh, some major truck line may oppose you, and uh, uh, they are called protestants. That is someone who's speaking for a position contrary to that which is being presented. So let us begin by taking a brief look at the history of the Anglican Communion and its connection with the whole idea of the universality of the Church, the Catholic Church. And the Church in what is now England dates back to the beginning of Christianity. And um, this is the new prayer book of the Anglican Church in North America, and I would commend to you the preface to this prayer book because it is basically uh, a covering of the history that I'm going to talk about today. In 35 AD, Joseph of Arimathea, who gave his tomb for Christ to be buried and who was, according to uh, some authorities, the uh, uncle of our Lord, uh, and an official in the Roman government, uh, sort of the uh, chief uh, examiner of mines for the Roman imperial government. And uh, after the resurrection and ascension of our Lord, Joseph of Arimathea and others from the Holy Land traveled to Marseille, France. And from there, they traveled to what is now England, uh, landing on the southwest coast of England, what is now dry land but then was uh, ocean, uh, at Glastonbury. And uh, some of you may know about the Glastonbury Thor and all of that, but this is where they landed. And uh, Joseph of Arimathea, there were three islands there, now three hills because the water's all gone. And uh, on World Hill, he planted his staff and he said, this is where we will build a church, establishing the first Christian church of what is now England. That staff grew into a thorn bush. And by tradition, that thorn bush blooms in the Christmas season.
but it also blows whatever a member of the royal family is present. And uh, this was a, a, a great sign in the church during the Reformation and then the English Civil War, uh, the Roundheads decided to destroy everything they could. It was a sign of the historic, traditional Catholic understanding of the Church of England. And so one of the soldiers went up on the Royal Hill and chopped down the Glastonbury Thorn. One of the thorns flew off and stuck him in the eye and he died 10 days later of blood poisoning. The Glastonbury Thorn grew back and it's still there on Royal Hill. I've been there many times. Tragically, about three years ago, someone else chopped it down again. Uh, but uh, it does survive, and one of the cuttings from the Glastonbury Thorn was planted on the grounds of Washington Cathedral in Washington, D.C. It grew into a thorn bush. And uh, just to give you some idea of how those traditions of ancient times still work out, I can recall in November of uh, 1955, I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time, and we were going to drive up to Gettysburg where there's a Roman Catholic seminary to visit a friend of mine who was a student at the seminary from my hometown. And so we decided to go to Washington Cathedral, which is on the way rather than our own parish, and go to the 8 o'clock service so we could get on our way up to Gettysburg. What we didn't know was the Queen Mother was coming for a state visit to, to the cathedral. So we came out of the 8 o'clock service and literally ran into the Queen's car. It was right there. I actually waved at the Queen Mother and she waved back. <laughs> this was in November. It was a cold Washington November Sunday. We went on up, visited with Paul at the seminary, came back Monday morning in the Washington Post. There was a picture of the dean of the cathedral presenting the Queen Mother with a blue cut from the Glastonbury Thor on the ground. It had blue in November. But Joseph of Arimathea did come to bring Christianity, but not only Joseph of Arimathea, but the Roman soldiers who came with the legions because the Romans did overrun and make Britain into a province. Some of the Roman soldiers who came were Christian. In the second century, the Roman military camp at Dover saw the building of the first church in that area, St. Mary's Church, Dover. The church is still there. Most of the original building has been replaced over the centuries, but the tile floor in, the, in front of the altar is dates back to the second century. And I remember standing at that altar on the same tile floor that priests had stood on for 1,800 years. The church is still in use. Uh, there is uh, St. Peter's Church Cornhill outside of what was London. That parish has been there since the second century. Um, this gives you some idea of when we talk about the church, uh, the Church of England, Ecclesia Anglicana, it's been there for all of these centuries. There is uh, also the martyrdom of St. Alban, the first Christian martyr in the British Isles. Alban was a Roman soldier. He was a pagan. At this time, of course, being a Christian was a crime punishable by death, and many Christians were captured and put to death. And in this case, Alban lived and was stationed north of what is now London in a town called Aurelium. Today it's called St. Albans. And uh, there was a priest there, Amphibalus, and the Romans were going to hunt him down and put him to death. And uh, Alban felt sorry for him and hid him in his house, even though he wasn't Christian. But during the time that Amphibalus was with Alban, he taught Alban the Christian faith. And Alban accepted the Christian faith. And the soldiers then, after uh, some days, began to make a house-to-house -house search for Amphibolus. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So all the put on the priest's cloak, told him to run out the back door while he ran out the front door and the soldiers followed him. They caught him and when they caught him, of course, by then the priest had escaped. They were then immediately saying, well, you know, what you committed is an act of treason. So he was sentenced to die, to be beheaded. And they took him to the place of execution. And he so eloquently expounded the Christian faith that the executioner says, I can't put this man to death. And the Romans put both of them to death there. It was in 209 AD. And uh, all of them was martyred and buried there. And of course, the place of his burial is now the cathedral of St. Albans. In the third century, we have not only Alban and the spread of the Christian faith, but we see the beginning of the organization of the church into what we would call today as dioceses. There was a bishopric at York, there was one at London, and there was one at Caerleon upon Usk, what is now Wales. These were the three primary bishoprics in uh, Britain. In 314 AD, uh, we have a change of situation. You recall that Constantine had come to the imperial throne, and Constantine's mother was a Christian, St. Helena. And Constantine was brought up respecting the Christian faith. He was not a Christian to begin with. In fact, he wasn't baptized until he was on his deathbed. But he was very pro-Christian. And he had decreed that the Christian faith would no longer be persecuted. He repealed the Roman laws persecuting Christianity. So for the first time in hundreds of years, the church was free. If you think back to the beginning of Christianity, when there were questions to be solved, how did the church deal with those questions? Well, if you read it in the 15th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, you will know that what they did is the apostles called a council of all the apostles and elders of the church. And they came together, in this case, to deal with the question of Gentile Christians, to what extent were they bound by Jewish law? And of course, the answer was they're not. And so you have that idea of a council as a means of resolving questions in the church. Under the time of the Roman persecution of Christians, this was not possible. But now in the fourth century, the church could begin to have councils again. And so in 314 AD, there was a big council called at Arles, France, to bring the Christians in Western Europe and the British Isles together. And the bishops of, uh, of London and York and Caerleon attended that council, representing the church in Britain. Uh, in 325, you have the first of the seven ecumenical councils meeting in Nicaea. We can't say for sure whether any of the British bishops attended, but we do know that they approved the decision of the council and did sign the declaration and, and canons of the Council of Nicaea. So we have this British church that is connected with the rest of the Christian church. Gradually, uh, in, in the Christian church, certain bishoprics began, because of the size of the city, the importance began to be important. You had, you had dioceses, they were grouped together into provinces. The bishop of a diocese was the diocesan bishop, but there would be a bishop of the province, an archbishop, who was over the entire province. And then gradually some of these provinces began to come together, which formed what were known as the five great patriarchies of the church. Uh, there was a patriarchy in Jerusalem where the Christian church began. Uh, there was a patriarchy at Antioch, uh, where St. Peter had been bishop for some 12 years. There was a patriarchy at Constantinople, which was the imperial capital of the East, and a patriarchy at Rome, the imperial capital of the West. These were the five great patriarchs. They did not include the British Isles. 
The British Isles were not part of any of those patriarchies. Indeed, a thousand years later, the Bishop of Rome, the Patriarch of the West, referred to the Archbishop of Canterbury as Papa Alter Orbis, the Pope of another world. <laughs> and uh, there have been times when some of the Archbishops of Canterbury have kind of liked that title, Papa Alter Orbis, the second Pope. But the church in the British Isles is as old as any part of the Christian church. It dates back to the first half of the first century. And it's interesting because if you'll recall, the Roman government was what kept peace. And in the fifth century, the Roman government was beginning to disintegrate in the West. And it was in the fifth century, uh, by 416, that the Roman legions were pulled out of Britain. And Typical governments, you know, governments make promises, and if they make promises, you know they're not going to do it. And the Roman government told the British when they came out, we'll come back. Well, they never did. But then the Angles and the Saxons and the Jews from Northern Europe began to invade. Here is this wonderful country, and it's unprotected. And so the barbarians came in. They hated Christians. You know, Christians are the most persecuted religion in the world today. 80% of all people put to death for their faith in the world are Christians. There are more Christian martyrs in the 20th century than in the first 19 centuries combined. And it looks like it's going to be worse in this century. And it was bad then. When the Angles and the Saxons and the Jews came and they found a, a community, uh, they would go in and the first thing they did was to destroy the church and kill the priests and as many people as they could and steal what they wanted. So the church began to be very much oppressed. And finally, as this Anglo-Saxon invasion went through most of what is now England, Christians for the most part were in Wales because the Welsh never were conquered by these barbarians. But the Welsh church and the, and the British church, having been organized by Joseph of Arimathea, was more like what today would be the Eastern Orthodox Church. It was not Western. It followed the liturgy of St. John. It followed the Eastern calendar, which was different, uh, which created some problems down the line. <clears throat> but even the Anglo-Saxons, we think of them as being barbarians who were not Christians. Uh, that's not totally true. Uh, in the 6th century, a, a Benedictine monk uh, by the name of Gregory uh, was in a slave market in Rome and there were a bunch of Anglo-Saxons having been captured by the Romans being sold into slavery. And he looked at them and they were unlike the people in Rome, because these were all blonde, blue-eyed people. And uh, I won't do the whole thing in Latin and in English, but uh, it's a play on words, because he asked them who they were, and their answer was they were angles. And he said, no, no, angels. <laughs> and where do you come from? And they said, from Ireland. And I have to say this in, in Latin. Deir, which in Latin also means the ire of wrath. And he says, if you are from the wrath of God, we will spare you. And he says, it's going to be my task to go to your people and bring the good news of Jesus Christ to your people. Unfortunately, before he could do that, he got elected Bishop of Rome, became Pope Gregory the Great. So he decided that he would send a missionary to England. And there was this Benedictine monk by the name of Augustine. And so he said to him, Augie, have I got a deal for you? <laughs> he said, I'm going to send you to England and you're going to be a missionary and convert these people to Christianity. And Augustine says, are you out of your mind? Do you know what these pagans do to Christians? And Gregory said, one of your 
vows was obedience. So you will obey. And so in 597, Augustine set out for England. And he went to the kingdom of Kent, which is, of course, the capital that is Canterbury. Now, I have to tell you a little bit about the kingdom of Kent at this time. The king of Kent was a fellow by the name of Ethelbert, and his wife was Hilda. The thing is, Hilda was a Christian, and she even had a chaplain from France, a bishop by the name of Ludot. And there was a church that had been a Christian church that the Anglo-Saxons had destroyed, St. Martin's Church, uh, in, in Canterbury. And uh, she had had it restored, and this is where she would go to services on Sunday and holidays. Uh, and there were a few in the, of her uh, quartery who were, who were Christians. There was already a Christian congregation there. And Hilda was like every other wife that deals with a husband that doesn't want to go to church. She was nanny-nanny. You need to go to church, you need to become a Christian, you need to be baptized. And he kept saying, don't bother me, don't bother me. And so here comes Augustine with his group, and they're going to come, and, and, and they're really worried what's going to happen when they, when they get there, they get into Kent. Uh, and Canterbury was, of course, originally a Roman city, so it was a walled city with a great wall around it. By the time the Anglo-Saxons took it over, the wall was crumbling in places because they didn't keep this stuff up. So they come into this, in effect, semi-ruined city with these semi-barbarian pagans, and they wonder what's going to happen. Well, when they get there, Ethelbert says, okay, Hilda's been after me for years to join the church, and now the church is sending a lot of people to pressure me. What am I going to do? He says, I give up. I will be baptized. And so he tells Augustine, all right, he'll accept the Christian faith, and they take him to St. Martin's Church and baptize him in the font there in the church. The interesting thing is that church building is still there, it's still a church. Uh, I've been there many a time for weekday services. Uh, the baptismal font that's used there is the same one that Ethelbert was baptized in 1,500 years ago. And he becomes a Christian. Well, if the king's going to be a Christian, everyone else says, well, we want to be on the right side of the people in power. And so, in a matter of weeks, practically the entire city becomes Christian. And Augustine says, hey, this mission business is pretty good. <laughs> and then he discovers that while he's there bringing Christianity to these people, there already are Christians from the British church. And a bunch of them are contacted by him. So he says, okay, uh, the Pope sent me here to be head of the church and everything. I need to talk to these other people and bring them in with me. So he says, we need to have a council to come together. And so the, uh, uh, the British Christians go to their bishop and they say, uh, this foreign bishop has come over uh, from across the channel and he's here talking about something about uh, a, a broader church. Do we accept him or what do we do with him? And the old bishop said, uh, arrange for a council and when you go to meeting, if he stands up to greet you, he is a man of God and follow him. If he doesn't, if he doesn't respect you, have nothing to do with it. So a council is called, called the Synod of the Oak, because we're meeting under a great oak tree. And unfortunately, when the British Christians come, Augustine remains seated. And he says, I am here as a representative of the Bishop of Rome and you are under our authority. And the response of the British Christians was, we have no idea what this Rome is. We've never heard of a Rome. And we have
have our own mission. And this led, in effect, to a separation between the Latin Rite and the uh, British Rite in the church, which tends to be Eastern. Remember that the, the first Christians coming to the British Isles came from the Holy Land, so they're Eastern. This creates an attention in the church. Although there is a coming together, you have two different parties uh, in the various little kingdoms in what is now England. And these different parties, in effect, create a division in the church. Do we follow the Eastern Rite or do we follow the Latin Rite? And the matter finally is resolved when we come into the 7th century and there is an attempt to bring the church in what is now England all together under the Archbishop of Canterbury, there is a synod held at Whitby. The king there, he says, we've got to put an end to this because he's following one right, his wife follows the other, which means if you know anything about the Eastern calendar versus the Western calendar, it's only about once every seven or eight years that Easter comes at the same time. And the king says, my Lent is over, my wife's still in Lent. He says, I that an extra long time of not getting to eat goodies. <laughs> so um, he says, we got to solve this. And it's interesting, it's the Abbess Hilda who presides over that council of Whitby in the 7th century. Very wise woman. And so she lets each side present their argument. The one, one side, the, the, uh, the Eastern Rite people are saying, well, uh, we're following what was laid out by St. John, uh, who is the beloved disciple of our Lord and the last of the apostles. And uh, the Western Rite people says, well, we're following St. Peter, who was the, the, the leader of the apostles, the head of the apostolic band. And so the king finally says, well, I'm going to go with Peter rather than John. And so they come to the agreement that the entire church will follow the Western Rite, which they do. So the Church of England at this point is pretty much on the same page with the church in Western Europe. But there is still this connection back to, uh, to the Eastern, and we will see that throughout the history of the Anglican Communion, this affinity for the, what is now the Eastern Orthodox Church. So, after the Council of Whitby, and then Theodore of Tarsus has become the Archbishop of Canterbury, and everyone said, well, uh, he's from St. Paul's hometown, but he's 65 years old. And we're talking in the 7th century. People don't normally live that long. He's going to be the Archbishop of Canterbury. He'll be dead in six months. We don't have to worry about it. Theodore lives for a number of years, 13 years, and uh, actually then is able to unite the church even before England becomes a united nation. The Church of England becomes one even before the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms all become one. So now we have we have the Church of England, Ecclesia Anglicana. Um, and um, of course one of the first great things to be written was the Venable B, uh, who wrote uh, 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 the Ecclesiastical History of the English People, uh, which is the history of the Anglican Communion. As the church is developed, this is an Anglo-Saxon church, history has a way of impacting that. And so in 1066, of course, if you know your history, that's when the Normans invade England. Now, think about this. The poor British got beat up by the Angles and Saxons and Jews, and about the time the Angles and Saxons take over, here comes a bunch of Normans, that originally Norsemen, Vikings, coming over from France, and defeating them again, and there is a whole overthrow, in a sense, of, uh, of Anglo-Saxon authority. And the church becomes Norman, and the Normans were much more allied with Rome than the Anglo-Saxons were. So you have, you have now this difference 
and you have a, fr a fraction division between the Anglo-Saxons and the Normans, even in the church. The last Anglo-Saxon Archbishop of Canterbury was Stigand, and his successor was Lan Frank, a Norman, put in power by William the Conqueror. So now we come to what begins to happen, and that is the English government is concerned about the authority of England. And although there is an attempt to put all of Western Christianity under the patriarchy of Rome, that doesn't really happen in England. The English Parliament, and this goes back even before the Norman Conquest, begins to pass laws that declare the independence of England from some of the imperial control, as it were, of the papacy. For example, in the Roman Catholic Church, there was a, a practice that if you were elected to an office like bishop, you had to pay annex or first fruits. That is, the first year of your salary all goes to Rome. So if you become the Archbishop of Canterbury, technically, whatever you got for the first year of your service as Archbishop, you had to pay as annex. And then there was an annual tax called a Peter Pence. You paid a, a penny for St. Peter's support in Rome. And the English Parliament this time passed an interesting series of laws. They made it a crime to pay annates or Peter Pence. They said, well, Rome may declare it, but we're saying if you do it, you go to jail. And then there was a provision in canon law in the Western Church that if there was a dispute, you could take an appeal to Rome to settle it. And again, the English Parliament passed a law saying anyone that takes an appeal to Rome will go to jail. Well, at this point, there was uh, the Archbishop of York was in the seventh century, a fellow named Wilfred. And the uh, church decided that the diocese of York was too big. They were going to carve it into four dioceses. And Wilfred said, you can't take three-fourths of my diocese away from me. And the church said, we did. He took an appeal to Rome as Archbishop of York. He says, Rome, your job is to protect me. Guess what? They threw him in prison for violating the law on appeals to Rome. So you have in the Church of England this idea, we're a part of the whole Catholic Church, yes, but we are our authority, not under uh, a patriarch on the continent. And probably the height of this comes in the 13th century when King John becomes the king of England, bad King John, bad King John, you all know about King John. And he is kind of oppressive of everyone. He oppresses the, the uh, nobility, he oppresses the peasants, he oppresses the church, everything. And the Archbishop of Canterbury dies, there's a vacancy. Now under the law of the Church of England, uh, when a, a, a diocese becomes vacant, the cathedral chapter will meet and elect a new bishop. And so the cathedral chapter at Canterbury meets to elect a new bishop. And King John says, no, 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 royal prerogative, I will appoint. So you've got the cathedral chapter has one person for Archbishop of Canterbury, and the king has another, and there's a clash well, we need to decide this. And so the king says, because they can't put him in jail, all right, let's take the question to the Pope. Innocent III is the Pope at the time. And let's ask Innocent which of these two should be Archbishop of Canterbury. So they go to Innocent. Both sides say, all right, we'll let him settle it. Innocent wants to get control in England. And so he says, perfect. There is a canon lawyer here in Rome, a good friend of mine, uh, by the name of Stephen Langton. And I think to solve this matter, we're going to appoint Stephen as Archbishop of Canterbury. That way I've got control. And Stephen is appointed, and, and the, the, the chapter's not happy, and John's not happy, but they accept it. So Stephen becomes the Archbishop 
vocabulary. And then, if you'll recall again your English history, at this point, uh, the, the nobility has had enough with King John, and so they draw up a declaration, the Magna Carta. And so they meet the king in front of me, and they've got the Magna Carta there, and they say, we want you to sign it, 63 declarations. The first and the last are identical. They say, the Church of England shall be free and hold her rights entire and inviolate. And John signs it. He doesn't really have much choice. But he's really unhappy about this. So he, he again, gets a hold of Innocent in Rome, and he says, you've got to do something. You've got your man in his archbishop of Canterbury. I want to get this Magna Carta out of here. I don't want it. So Innocent writes a letter to uh, Stephen Langton, and he says, you are hereby ordered to burn the Magna Carta publicly in the streets of London and issue a decree to be read in every cathedral in England suppressing the Magna Carta. Stephen Langton gets the letter, and what does he do? He burns the papal bull publicly in the streets of London and orders the Magna Carta to be read every month in every cathedral in England. So, this gives you some idea that, this, that yes, we are all in the same church, but we're not all in the same authority. And so you get this development then of the Church of England as an independent church. And this is true, you see. Rome is the patriarch of the West. And it wasn't until the 11th century that there is this split between the four patriarchies of the East and that of the West in, 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 uh, in, in the Great Schism that takes place in the uh, 11th century. So that at that point, of course, the Eastern Orthodox and Western Catholic churches are separated, uh, and, which is a great tragedy. And, and something that we really want to try to recover. But bear that in mind. The, for the first thousand years of its history, Christianity is two thousand years old. But for the first half of its history, we were all one. Different languages, different cultures, different nations, but one church. But after the 11th century, there are two. And then, of course, you have uh, uh, in the West, partly for political and partly for theological reasons, you begin to get some questioning of authority and you end up then uh, on the continent in what's known as the Protestant Reformation, which begins with Martin Luther and his 39 Theses, which are nailed on the door of the uh, Church of Wittenberg, Germany. Interesting, uh, that was on uh, October the 31st, they were nailed to the door of the, of the church there. That's Halloween. <laughs> because the next day is All Saints Day, and it was All Saints Church where the theses were nailed. Well, that begins the Reformation, and that does have an effect on all of the churches in the West. Even the Church of England is impacted by and there are questions back and forth. And so finally, the Reformation comes to England, and it's interesting, it's not like in the other countries. Henry VIII is the king, and, and he has some arguments, obviously, with the papacy over the question of uh, uh, dissolving marriages. Not so much divorce, really, as a moment. And I won't go into all of that, just whether he's right or wrong. The point is, what did the Church of England say uh, when the king says, okay, we're, we're going to declare that uh, we're not under the Pope? And the Church of England said this, the Bishop of Rome has no more authority in England than any other foreign bishop. No less, no more. We're not breaking with him. He's still a Bishop of Rome, but he doesn't have any authority here. And that was the English Reformation. And the services continued in Latin. Uh, and as a matter
matter of fact, do you know that even under English canon law after the Reformation, that Latin services were required in the Church of England? Every cathedral was expected to have a service in Latin at least once a month, and all of the chapels at the University of, in Cambridge and um, uh, at Oxford were expected to have services in Latin. Now, why? Because the Church of England said, well, the services have to be in a language that people understand. And you couldn't go to college if you didn't know Latin. So you can require Latin services. And there is one parish in Cambridge, in the Church of England, that has never had services in English. To this day, they still have services in Latin. There is a Latin prayer book. I have one. I sit back in Latin. It's a language understood by me, not as well as English, but I do understand it. So this was the Reformation in England. It was not like what happened uh, on the continent. A new church was not established. The same bishops, the same priests, the same deacons, the same church buildings, the same services. Finally, in 1549, we came out with the first prayer book in English. And uh, that was the service that was used. Uh, it was replaced in 1552 by a second prayer book, which was then replaced by a third prayer book in 15. 59 and finally uh, 1662 which was the last official English language prayer book in the Church of England but as I say services continued in, in Latin as well uh, so the Reformation in England brought some changes to the church but the basic structure of the church uh, the basic sacramental life of the church the basic teaching of the church remained the same. Uh, and, and in fact, the, uh, the early uh, uh, reformers of the church saw themselves not as creating a new church, but as simply updating the church that was there. Uh, and, and this was understood by the English reformers. They were looking to return to the church as it was in its earliest days, which meant they were interested in Eastern theology and thought. There was a return to the early fathers of the church and especially of the East. It was just the way they were going. And that was part of the history that we have to understand. And uh, it's interesting that unlike the continent, what happened in England shaped us to be to see ourselves as Catholic. You know, for example, a lot of Lutherans, and I, I was bishop in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and uh, they say in Wisconsin there are more Lutherans than people. <laughs> um, in fact, one of my Lutheran bishop friends says, yes, Lutherans are very dense in Wisconsin, but they're denser in Minnesota. <laughs> um, but the Lutherans, of course, had, had had to fight the Roman Catholics. So Lutherans, even to this day, there's a, even though they have learned to get along, there still is a clash. And I can remember if we were in dialogue with the Lutherans, they say, why are you not in that same position? Because uh, under Queen Mary, Bloody Mary, Queen Mary, uh, uh, the Roman Catholics did a horrible lot of stuff to your people. And we said, yeah, that was uh, in, in the 16th century, but in the 17th century, the Presbyterians did worse to us in the English Civil War. They beheaded our king and the Archbishop of Canterbury and made it a crime to use the prayer book. So, you know, if we're going to be mad at anyone, it's more likely to be Protestants. <laughs> I mean, we, we kept caught up from both sides. So that makes us Catholic, doesn't it, to be persecuted by both sides. But that's part of the history of the Church of England. And as the Church spread out, the Church of England, of course, took seriously our job is to take the good news of the gospel to all people. And so the Church of England, which then included the Church of Scotland, the Church in Wales, the Church of Ireland, and in all these instances, it were the 
ancient sees the ancient bishoprics were part of what was going on. The Archbishop of Armagh was the head of the church in Ireland. He still is. Uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury was the head of the church in England. He still is. Uh, now the Presbyterians did finally take over the Scottish church and made it Presbyterian, but there was a remnant that stayed Anglican. Then Anglican missionaries began to take this out to the rest of the world. And so we had Anglican missionaries who went to India. We had Anglican missionaries who went to uh, uh, Persia. We had Anglican missionaries who went to Africa. We had Anglican missionaries that came to America. The first permanent English colony in America was in Jamestown, and the first building built was a church for a priest who came over and served in Jamestown, and that community is still there. The first Christian service held in what is now the United States was on the West Coast by Sir Francis Drake in the 16th century. So the Anglican Church became a worldwide communion, but understood itself as part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. And that's the way we define ourselves. Anglicans are that part of the one holy Catholic and apostolic church in communion with the Sea of Canterbury. And so we are, in that sense of the word, clearly part of the Catholic church by history. And this is very important that this is by history, not by fiat or claim. This is actually the way it is. Uh, and, and it's interesting. <laughs> Legally, there are impacts. For example, back in the 20th century, there was a piece of property in London that had been leased to a secular part of the city of London for 999 years. And when the lease was up, the property came back to the Anglican Church. And the court said, same church at least it almost a thousand years ago. It's the same. Uh, and that we have to understand that as we look at church history, the Anglican Communion is part of the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, proclaiming the three creeds, the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasian Creed, recognizing the seven ecumenical councils, and recognizing uh, the theological teaching in the fullness of Holy Scripture. You know, as one of the questions you can always say, this is a funny question, how many books is the Bible? <coughs> yes, yes, the average Methodist or Baptist, They'll say 66 books, you know, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. But that's not the answer. The answer is 80, because there are 14 books in the Apocrypha, which we read in the daily office and in some of the Eucharistic services. Uh, so we, we have the fullness of Holy Scripture. All seven sacraments, the two sacraments of our Lord, baptism in the Holy Eucharist, and those five commonly called sacraments. Confirmation, confession, ordination, unction, and marriage. The seven sacraments. So you say, what part of the Catholic faith do we not have? And if you say the papacy, I'd say, well, don't ever say that to a Russian Orthodox. <laughs> but what we're saying then is that historically, we are embracing the Catholic faith. Now having said that, I've come to the end of our first hour.